All right. Now, last week, uh, we touched on sexual purity, touched on sexual purity. I think we hit sexual purity pretty hard. But this is change, a change of subject. we got a complete change of subject going into this. And as we go through this, the last half of this really is the area, and I just want to uh, put this in as a preface, uh, where people that believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, this is the, the scripture that they really lean on as the, where they get the main idea for it. So as we get to that point, I am going to present it in that manner. Now, I know that there's people in here that are pre, mid, post, or it'll all come out in the wash, or whatever you are, and however you believe about the rapture. But because of this particular text, I'm just going to go to the one side. I'm not going to try to present every point of view on the rapture, because I'm not teaching on the rapture. I'm just teaching on this portion of Scripture. So as long as everybody's aware of that, we all are on the same page. So uh, personally, my belief, if you care, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. That's, you know, that's going to be really cool if that happens. If it doesn't, my hope is still in Jesus. So, you know, that's where it's at. I'm looking for Christ to come back, and whenever that is, I want to be tickled about it, or I'm going to be up with him already, one way or the other. So, uh, I just wanted to say all that before we begin. So let's go ahead and look at verse 9. Now, signifying the change of subject from the previous section from last week. About your love for one another. We do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And this, this whole idea is something that Jesus hit uh, very hard. And I just wanted to just hit a couple of verses here before we dig in. John 13, 34. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Yet you must love one another. And in 15, verse starting in 12, he says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 13 says, Keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. And the beloved apostle John in the first letter of John uh, chapter 2 verse 10 says, Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. Now, if you really consider this and you think about all the teaching that we have about loving the brothers and sisters, this idea, uh, this love is not the agape love of God. This is filio. This is the love of brothers and sisters. This is the love of family. So you have this group of people that are coming together from all different walks of life in the early church. There's, some of them are slaves. Some of them are the slaves' masters, owners. Some of them are rich. Some of them are poor. What, for, and they come from all these areas and all these different places. Not only are they different families, different socioeconomic statuses, all these things, but when they come together as the body of Christ, as they come together in the church, as the church, they are to have a, a, a brotherly love, a familial love, that they could lean on there. And just think about that. Do we have that in our body here? Do we, we have that kind of love? They were expected to have it there whenever it was a brand new idea in their society. And they were expected to have it. And apparently the Thessalonian church exemplified it so much so that Paul says, I don't really need to touch on this because you guys have got this down. But I want us to just consider how we do that for each other today. And it doesn't matter if we're in this congregation or we have another congregation or it's a congregation on the other side of the world. If we are in Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And because of that, we should have a love one for another. And that's the idea that he wants to get here and for the church to understand. So right there, you've been taught by God. It was something that in the hearing of the word, they received it and God himself spoke it into them in such a way that it just came out in everything that they did. Starting in, or moving on to 10 now. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. And make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. And so that you will not be dependent on anybody. And in fact... You do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. In fact, you do love. It's already there. It's evident. 
that love has been talked about. It has been spread abroad. When Timothy come back and brought the report, he had not only his experience at the church, but to all the, the people that were round about that were talking about it. And when he came and he shared that with the apostles that hadn't, wasn't able to travel back to Thessalonica at that time, he told them of this love and how it reached out to all of these people. <clears throat> but he says, we want to encourage you to do this more and more. So how do we do that? Whenever you're already exemplifying a characteristic that uh, shows that you're in Christ, how do you do that more and more? How do you move on past, okay, I'm doing all that I can to doing beyond what you can? You do that by the power of God in your life. For instance, 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. It is the provision of God, the grace of God on your life, that as you are exemplifying Christian attributes, as you're showing the love of God to others, to be able to do even more is to allow God's presence to flow through you, God's love to fl flow through you to other people. You can't do it. You never could. That's the whole illustration that Ju Jesus uses of the branch and the vine, where you have to, the branch has to be supplied by the vine to be able to produce anything. If you cut it off, it dies. There's nothing to it. So they have to be connected. You connected to the Lord produces fruit in your life, and that fruit can produce abundantly because of the vine's power or God's power flowing through you. That's that same idea, the same concept. So not only can you do what you're doing right now, whenever you're reaching out to touch the lives of other people. But brothers and sisters, if you're allowing God to work through you, you can abound more. You can do more. Every one of us can do more. Well, I feel like I'm about to ask for money. Everyone can go on and do more because of the power of God in your life. So if you love somebody, you can love them more. If you give of your time, you can give more. Why? Because God will provide as it is needed, as it is necessary. He will make a way for that to happen for you. Verse 11, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life, you should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you. That sounds like we got some busybodies here in Thessalonica, doesn't it? Okay, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. I mean, you should strive for. This is the thing that you're reaching for and trying to do, to making a real effort at this. Now, a lot of the commentators that I was reading upon this particular passage, especially regarding uh, the uh, idea of the rapture that's contained in the later verses, really believe that part of the issue that's being addressed here is the fact that the believers in Thessalonica thought that Jesus was coming at any day. He could show up tomorrow. And if he's showing up tomorrow, why do I need to be at work? Why do I need to be doing anything? They were running around talking about the Lord's coming back. The Lord's coming back. Jesus is coming back. You got it ready. It's, it's time to be ready for the Jesus to come back. You put, the, put the hoe down. You don't need a garden because you ain't going to be here. You know, those kind of things. It kind of gives you that kind of attitude about it, that maybe that's what was going on. Pure speculation. But perhaps that is what's going on. And that's why he dresses it in this way. Your ambition is to lead a quiet life to strive to mind your own business, okay? So you're walking in the Lord, you're serving the Lord as he leads you, but you're not all up in everybody's face and telling them about it. Whenever God gives you the opportunity, you just you share, you do the things that you're supposed to, but you lead the life that he has given you. And as you do so, you're going to set an example. And as you set that example, the example becomes the witness. And that's what he's getting at, to lead a quiet life, Mind your own business. Don't be a busybody. Don't be trying to tell other people how they need to be living their lives because your example is to be your witness. <clears throat> so in all of this, as we come down to it, in uh, verse 12, he says, so that your daily life, right? Which is what I was just, just saying. So that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders. So if you're living a quiet life, you're minding your own business, you're working diligently with your hands, you're doing your job, whatever it is, you're living your life, and in your work, you're, you're uh, loving Jesus. 
you're minding your own business in the regard that you're not uh, out protesting in the streets and carrying on like a fool and, and, and making a, a spectacle of yourself. You're honoring the Lord. Your ambition is to lead a quiet life. These things stacked up here all come together to make a witness. Now, I know this seems antithetical to the way the world works today because if you want something known, you got to get out and make it known. We got to get out and we got to carry signs and we got to pick it and carry on. Does that ever change anybody's mind? Have any of you guys watched any of the protests in the streets and you thought, wow, hey, I never thought of it like that. I think that I've changed my mind on that thing. Or did it just make you mad and think, these idiots are just making everybody late to work, right? It doesn't change anybody's mind. It actually solidifies people in their position. But if your life is an example, you're just doing your thing, loving Jesus, and letting it show in the way that you do your work and everything about you, your life then becomes the witness and as your life is the witness, somebody will walk up to you and say, hey, you know, I noticed that these circumstances are happening, but they don't seem to bother you. How is it that you're not bothered by this stuff? And you can say, let me tell you about my Jesus. And you get a chance to share. And you get a chance to tell them about the love of God. You get a chance to touch their lives. See, the gospel was never one for being out in the streets and in your face and overthrowing governments and that kind of thing. That's not what the gospel is about. The gospel is about changing one person's life. And then that person changing another person and that person changing another person. And gradually, by the changing of the individual, you work Christianity out through society from the inside out. It's not a huge movement that's going to overwhelm like a tidal wave. It's this slow rise of everybody as they come to know Jesus and love him. That's what changes a society. We want to change the world that we live in. We want to change this country because we think that some of the laws and some of the things that are being passed are anti-biblical, that they're against the will of God. What we've got to do, brothers and sisters, is we've got to change people's minds one person at a time. And every person that we change, they need to have Jesus in their heart. And when they have Jesus in their heart, then Jesus is going to guide them to go and change other people's minds. And you know what? That's going to change our country. It'll change our state. It'll change our, our town. It'll change every aspect of our society if we are diligent in doing the things that we need to do to be a good example and to let people see what the love of Jesus really is all about. Now, moving on to 13. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death and do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. He uses the terminology, the same terminology that Jesus used in, uh, uh, when he was referring to Lazarus, whenever he told the disciples that our friend Lazarus is asleep. And all the disciples are like, oh, if he's rested, he'll get better. And he's like, I, I, I know this is me, but uh, I can almost see him whenever he's telling that, you know, our friend Lazarus is asleep. And uh, the disciples are saying, well, well, yeah, just let him rest then. I can see Jesus rolling his eyes. Ugh. He's dead. <laughs> and then coming back into, you know, a believer to be dead is to just be asleep in the Lord. And that's the same terminology that Paul's using here, right? So this idea of sleep. I don't know. I just, I just picture that sometimes about Jesus and how the disciples didn't get it and how he rolls his eyes. And then I think, look at us and... He's either rolling in the floor sometimes because we do things that are so silly or he's just in a constant eye roll because we miss the point. It's just the way we live our lives today. But when we get it right, we bring true joy. We do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind. You do not grieve like those who do not believe. Now, you probably have all been to a funeral of somebody that was an unbeliever. And maybe most of the family were unbelievers. Have you seen the reaction that they have to a funeral, to death? And this is not saying that you don't grieve whenever a loved one passes. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that you don't do it like they do it. I was at a funeral one time, and it was just, I wasn't performing a funeral. I was just there as a friend. And the family, uh, a lot of them were not believers. And I have never heard such wailing and carrying on. 
And it, it, was, it was bad. It was the death of a child. And it was, it, was, it was a bad situation. It was. But the fact that because they didn't know Jesus and the one that died didn't know Jesus, it wasn't a young child. It was a young adult child. But the wailing that that mother did over the loss of her child just absolutely was just unlike anything I had ever heard or experienced before. And I thought to myself, that is what true anguish in your soul sounds like. That is what hopelessness sounds like. And I've been to a lot of other funerals where the, the person that has passed it was a believer. And those times, yes, they're sad and, and people are crying and, and uh, grieving, but it isn't the hopeless wailing. It's the, uh, it's the loss of relationship and not getting to see them right now. But behind all of that is still the hope of seeing them in the future, the hope of being reunited with them again. There's still a hope in it. And so even the ones that are grieving, they try to, to put a, a bright face on it and smile because I'm sad at the moment, but I know I'm going to see them again. You know, there's going to be another day. There's going to be a brighter day coming. And, and I know this. And so I'm walking in this and I'm standing in this to help me get through this time right now. It's just a different feel. Yeah, it's sad, but it is not hopeless. So don't grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Don't be like that. Once again, a lot of the commentators point back to this and say, just like the other part right here, the Thessalonians, the, the, they thought that they, they were so excited about Jesus coming back. They so anticipated his return at any moment that they were afraid that their friend or loved one that had died had missed out because they were gone. They had missed out. So what, what are we going to do? They're, they're, they've already died and, and Jesus is going to be back any day now. And, and they're not going to be there to, to, to meet him, to, to be able to be part of that. And this is where he comes by. We do not want you to be uninformed. And he goes on to explain the rest of how this is going to go. This gets into uh, the doctrinal issue that I was talking about whenever we started. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Okay? That passage right there is the one that they, uh, most people lean on that uh, look for a pre-tribulation rapture. So let's break it down. In 14, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. There is a core belief in being a Christian. And it starts out with, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? You have to believe that. You have to have that foundation. We believe this, okay? He died. Not only did he die, but he rose again on the third day. Right? This is part of a confession of faith. So you believe that Jesus died on the cross, and that he rose again on the third day. Foundational beliefs of Christianity, the thing that's right there. But because we believe this, Paul's saying, we, so, we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And that's just it. That once you're in Christ, you're in Christ. Doesn't matter if you're in this world or the next. You are in Christ. You guys get that? So... And as believers, as, as uh, people that have been in church for a long time, this is something that we just hang our hat on and we just understand that to be the, the facts. That once you're in Jesus and you're his, you're his. You're in his hands at that time. Right? He's got control of you. So those who are fall asleep in him. So all of those people that are already in him are with him. If they're with him, when Jesus comes, they're going to come with him. So 
they're, you're going to see them all again. That's where he uh, wants them to get this foundational thought through so that they understand that. <clears throat> now, in this, the way this is phrased, there's a lot of argumentation. I've got notes on it, but I don't think that I want to go into that right now because it's argumentation against the other two points of view uh, of the rapture based on where this starts, and I'm just going to skip over that and go right to 15. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Right here, we tell you that we who are still alive this indicates, or would seem to indicate, that Paul himself, not only did he teach the Thessalonians that Jesus was coming any day, but he himself believed it. He himself was looking forward to it. Now, he might not have thought it was going to be this week, but he knew he was coming soon. He was looking forward to the return of Christ. And there was uh, someplace I read a fellow say that, um, and I, I've caught myself in... Um, especially looking at end times events. Uh, it seems to be a favorite topic of a lot of people uh, today as we're looking at things that are lining up here and there that may be fulfillment of prophecy as we consider those things. He said, we were never taught to look for an antichrist. We were taught to look for Christ. And I really had to stop and think about that really simple statement for a moment. And I thought, yeah, we get caught up in all the prophecy stuff and we start looking, is this a fulfillment or is this a fulfillment? Is this, a, is, uh, uh, you know, is uh, this president or that president the Antichrist or this world leader or that world leader the Antichrist? You know, what, you know you, people start looking and kind of trying to play that game that we play in that regard. But that's absolutely true. We're not supposed to look for the false one. You and I, brothers and sisters, we are looking for the real one. And we know where we need to be looking. We need to be looking up. Not at anybody down here. We're looking to the sky for Jesus to come back. That's a clear teaching of Scripture. So, as we consider that, that's where we need to be. We're not looking and we're not worried about all this other stuff because we know that Jesus is coming back. And are we living our lives in light of the soon return of Christ? Consider that for a moment. Am I living my life like Jesus could come back tomorrow? We don't know when he's coming back. He could. Or it could be 10 years from now, or more, or less. We don't know. And because we don't know, it is so much more important that we live our lives every day to be the example that has already been talked about so that we are always found diligently about the Lord's business when he comes. When he shows up, we don't want to be like the kid that's sitting around watching the videos instead of doing their homework. Right? Anybody have a child that you have trouble getting them off the, the phones and you, they won't do their homework? Are we past that? How about adults? You're on your phone looking at videos instead of doing your work work. Right? We don't want to get caught doing something we're not supposed to be doing when Jesus comes back. And since we don't know when he's coming back, let's always be about what Jesus wants us to be doing. Hey, that sounds pretty simple, right? A little harder to live, but it is still simple. You have to make a choice where you want to be whenever Jesus comes back. So we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. I had an extra line there that I should have deleted as I was copying that slide. Sorry about that. Now, <clears throat> we're not going to get there before them because we're all going to go about the same time whenever he comes back. For the Lord himself will come down in 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. Okay. Now, I'm just going to bring this to this place where this argument comes in. The Lord himself is going to come. When Jesus left, what did he say? He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come back and receive you to myself so that you may be where I am. Right? As he said that, he ascended into heaven to prepare a place. That means, brothers and sisters, as Scripture teaches us that the church is the bride of Christ, Christ is the bridegroom, the bridegroom, the bride price has been paid on the cross. So you have the, uh, oh, why did I just go blank on that word? The betrothment, okay, you're betrothed to Christ. At that moment, the church is. Okay, so Jesus goes away. Now this all plays into and is parallel to the uh, wedding ceremony that was celebrated, the way they celebrated in that day. That the, they would get betrothed, it could be happened as they were a child, it could be later on, but then the, the, the groom would go away for a while to prepare a place at his father's house to receive his bride. And after his, that place was prepared, he would come back to take his bride to go and be where he is, to be with him at that time. So the whole idea is this, is that Christ, the groom, has ascended into heaven. He's prepared a place for us, and now he's going to come back to take his bride to be where he is. And that's the illustration of the, the wedding uh, uh, ceremony. There, that's where the, all of the, uh, the ritual, there's, there's all of these other little parts that happen in there, but all that it takes place in heaven. And... Any illustration or analogy that you make is going to fall short. So you can't just go uh, absolutely step by step. But at the end of it all, after everything is said and done, there's a wedding feast. And what does it say at the, in Revelation 19? That there is the marriage feast of the Lamb. Right? Where the groom, Jesus, the bride, the church, is all celebrated in this wedding feast. And blessed are those who are invited to the feast. So this whole idea here is where they, you kind of pull that out. So that idea that the church is going to pull out comes out of, this, out of this passage of Scripture. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command. That shout is the, uh, kind of the idea of uh, whenever uh, warriors would go into battle. Uh, I don't know if you guys watch any of the historical dramas or any of the things that happen where they, they show the two armies Everyone with their swords and shields and the two armies are going to clash. And there's someone gives that first command to, to go forward. And then the whole army gives a shout back, right? So whenever you picture that, when he says that loud command, that's kind of what you want to picture there. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God, all of these things. Jesus is going to give the command that it's time to move forward because he, God says now. Jesus says, let's go and then everyone else in heaven is going to shout and carry on. There's going to be the voice of the archangel. There's going to be the trumpets of God. All of this is going to sound. And that's whenever he comes back to take his bride. We don't know when that, when that time is going to be. Day or morning, evening. It's all, that's all irrelevant. Because in that moment, the dead in Christ will rise first. Power of God is not stopped by anything. They're going to rise first in their resurrected bodies. They're going to be brand new creations in God. And then guess what? Those that are alive, whoever that may be, Paul expected himself to be in that group apparently, whoever's left is going to get their resurrection body and go up too. So you're not going before them, you're going with them. And that's what they wanted them to understand. <clears throat> now, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven, 16, with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them, caught up together. That's the word we want to hang on to there. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so that we will be with the Lord forever. Caught up together. That caught up together right there, that's where we get the whole idea of the rapture. That's the Greek word, harpazo. Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that. But it means to be snatched away quickly, irresistibly, to be pulled away. Uh, so it gives you that idea of the, where we talk about the rapture in the twinkling of an eye. Bam, right? We're all gone. That's that quickly, that word that, that is, means that you're pulled out. Um, that caught up together. Now, uh, a lot of the argument against the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture is that nowhere in Scripture 
does the word rapture show up? Well, harpazo translates into Latin, and I tried to get this pronunciation right, so forgive me, I'm going to try this. In Latin, it's rapiemur, rapiemur, raptus, rapiemur. Okay, rapiemur in the Latin Vulgate, which was the translation that people used for hundreds of years before King James said, hey, make me a new one. This uh, Latin Vulgate, rapiemur, was the word that was there, and that is literally where the, in English we de derive the word rapture from. And that means to be, uh, what was, it says we will be raptured, is that to the definition that we looked up? Okay. I had Sydney help me look up the definition. It, we, we, you'll be raptured. You'll be taken away. Right? So you get that whole concept at that point from that, from that word. So we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You're not going to meet here. We're going to meet in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. And that's where you go back to his place. Now, this is the whole idea. Now, there's other stuff. There's other things that we can look at. There's other arguments. And I've got a bunch of stuff written down. If you want to talk about it later, we can talk about it. But that's how that looks. And that's where that's coming from. And that's where that idea comes from. Now, I'll say this. Personally, I like the idea of not being here during the tribulation. I don't know about you guys. I'm all for going to heaven early. Now, but regardless of when that is, if that idea happens to be incorrect and it's mid or it's afterwards or whatever that happens, brothers and sisters, the fact remains that you and I are called the one thing to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ whatever comes, to stand on his word, to stand on the truth of his word and in your relationship with him. And that way, no matter when it is, you will always be ready. And I think we can all agree on that, right? Final verse, verse 18, simply says, therefore, encourage one another with these words. In all of his instruction, this idea that he wants is the idea that you guys are living examples of the love of God to other people. You guys don't have to worry about those that have died because you're going to see them again. You're going to be a witness. Everything, you just keep following the Lord and everything is going to work out fine. Encourage one another with these words. This teaching that he gives, whether you want to go into a rapture or not, the idea here is that you're going to see your loved ones again. You're going to get to be with them, and you're going to get to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever, whenever that occurs. Now, we need to encourage one another with those words. It's what Paul's instruction is, and I believe that that stands the test of time, regardless of your theological standpoint about a rapture encourage one another that you know what we are going to get to see our loved ones and not only that we're going to get to be with them and with the lord jesus christ in heaven for the rest of eternity so let's encourage one another